I want to welcome everybody today. My name is Dr. Eric Toring. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. And we're very happy to have you today uh, as part of our, our webinar series. So with that, I want to now turn it over to Dr. Kaylee Pettit, who is a representative of our ACVPM Continuing Education Committee. Dr. Pettit. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you on behalf of the CE Committee for attending our webinar. I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott D., uh, our speaker today. He has earned a DVM, MS, and PhD from the University of Minnesota, is board certified in veterinary microbiology, and was past president of, of the AASV. After 12 years in both swine practice and academia, uh, Dr. D joined Pipestone Veterinary Services as Director of Applied Research and currently serves as Emeritus Director of Discovery and Innovation for Pipestone. He has been awarded more than 12.5 million in research funding and published 178 peer-reviewed papers, including the initial publications on the proof of concept of PEDV transmission and feed and the transboundary survival of AS. ASFV in feed. He received the AASV Practitioner of the Year, the Howard Dunn Memorial, and the Layman Science and Practice Awards, a warrior chip from the FBI, and is a master of the U.S. pork industry. In 2022, he guest edited a special, special issue on feed risk and transboundary and emergency, emergency, emerging diseases and awarded the Distinguished Service to the pork, U.S. Pork Industry Award from the National Pork Board. Dr. D, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Pettit, Dr. Toring, also Dr. Fletcher. And I think Dr. Susan Harper actually nominated me for this honor. So I do appreciate the honor. And I, I really uh, consider it an honor that the CE committee uh, asked me to spend some time with you all. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this. It's a favorite topic of mine. It's a a new area of science, it's basically nine years old. I'll tell you the story, kind of how it all began. Uh, this is the risk of feed as a vehicle for the transport and transmission of viruses of veterinary significance, what we know and what can we do. And you see a lot of logos there listed. This is a big team that we've built over the years. You've got members of obviously our Pipestone team, but also Dr. Eric Nelson uh, from South Dakota State, Dr. Diego Diel, who was at South Dakota State, now at Cornell, Dr. Megan Niederwerder from Kansas State, and now is at the Swine Health Information Center, Plum Island team, um, Sam Nutrition, Minnesota Board of Animal Health. You'll hear how all of these groups interacted and contributed to this idea. And I'd like to uh, really thank uh, the Swine Health Information Center, because that's where a lot of the money came from for this as well as Transbounding Emerging Diseases, the journal where most of this was published. So what I'd like to do is tell a story. So it's kind of late in the afternoon and you're probably kicking back after a hard day. Uh, let's have a cup of coffee and pull a book off the shelf and look, go through this story and table of contents you see listed here, chapter one. We're gonna basically you know, say, why is this important? This is like preaching to the choir, but why is this feed risk thing important? Uh, number two, how it all began when porcine epidemic diarrhea virus entered the United States. What's the story behind our discovery of PED transmission and feed? Chapter three, the laboratory work that many of us conducted looking at viruses of many different types, their ability to survive and be transmitted through feed at the laboratory level, but also now what's happening in the real world. We've actually got some real cases of virus movement uh, from country to country, as well as farm to farm. So um, I think that's kind of, it's, it's eye-opening. And you see what you think about it when we get to it, but it's the seeing is truly believing. Chapter five, you know, I've always wanted to change human behavior in a positive way through science. I'll show you what we're doing about this risk. What's the swine industry doing? And then how, what's happening around the world? And then we'll close it up. So that's our, that's our agenda for today. So chapter one, why is the risk of feed important? What are viruses of veterinary significance that seem to survive and be transmitted through feed? Well, several of you probably recognize up in the upper left-hand corner, that's foot and mouth disease virus. Uh, the red photomicrograph right next to that is classical swine fever virus. Um, there's PED in the upper right-hand corner, more of a, a domestic disease now, but was uh, uh, considered a transboundary disease several years, several years ago. 
Le uh, lower left-hand quarter, that's a Jusky's disease virus or pseudorabies. In the middle there, that big monster, that's African swine fever virus that our swine industry is so concerned about right now. And then there's Seneca virus in the little blue uh, photomicrograph there of, uh, of that virus. So these are viruses that are obviously very important to agriculture because as we know, and we've seen if they ever would enter North America or enter the United States, FMD has estimated a cost to roughly 12.9 billion the first year. Classical swine fever would hit about 9.6 billion and ASF would top the charts at 16 and a half billion, all basically through the first year. Obviously exports would shut down, uh, grain exports would be hindered, uh, even vacations, vacationers don't even want to come to the countries with these diseases because they're afraid they might pick something up. I've read about that. The only thing I've read that actually goes up during these uh, terrible uh, things is the suicide rate. And uh, a lot of a lot of people end their lives during these outbreaks. You can read about that from the UK, from the from Netherlands. That's the only metric that I've seen that goes up. And it's pretty easy to see why that would happen because this is how it gets managed or has been managed over the years. So this is a very brutal, gruesome experience. I can't imagine uh, what goes on. So that's obviously to set the stage. And again, you're familiar with that, but it, uh, when you talk to some groups, they may not be aware of just the danger that feed imports could potentially deliver to North America. So how it all began. It really started for me back in January of 2014 when I first discovered the ability of PED virus or porcine epidemic diarrhea virus to be transmitted through feed. So there you see the virus and there you see what it does. It basically kills 100% of the baby piglets that are seven days or less through uh, villus atrophy, diarrhea, dehydration, and death. So it's when that happened, this is about uh, 2013, in April or so in Indiana, Ohio, uh, this new virus showed up and everybody thought it was transmissible gastroenteritis virus, which we'd had in the US for a long time, but all the tests came up negative and then it became, it was discovered to be PED. So one of the things I always try to do is write this up so we can publish these experiences and learn from them. And so I'd like to introduce a case study that I, uh, kind of took me on this journey again back in January of 2014 when we published this first uh, proof of concept really looking at whether if pigs consumed virus contaminated feed would they become infected with PED. So the story begins uh, right after the New Year's in, in 2014. I still probably had a hangover and I was uh, trying to work up cases of, of PED in our Pipestone farms. Pipestone, if you know anything about our company, uh, we were 300,000 sows, six veterinary clinics. It's one of the largest pig enterprises in the world. And we've got cell farms that we manage for our customers, and we biosecure these cell farms like they're Fort Knox. So they're air filtered. They've got a transport sanitation program, shower and shower rod for people, supply entry is all controlled. But all of a sudden, within about a two or three day period of time, several of these farms all broke with uh, sows or farrowing sows and piglets uh, with vomiting and diarrhea. And I just show you three of these farms. This is from the publication. Uh, I did a little field epidemiology. I'm not an epidemiologist like many of you are. I apologize. But I, I went to three of these farms and tried to figure out what was going on. And each of these, I think Farm A was in Minnesota. Farm B was in South Dakota. Farm C was in Iowa. They had no common feed mill but they were all very well biosecured. And all of a sudden, boom, you can see uh, they all had a feed outage. That was the one commonality uh, across all three farms is within a few days, there was a bin on the farm that ran out of feed. And you see where that occurred in each of these farms, the gestation area and farm A, farrowing farm B, gestation again, farm C. So the, the bins are empty, the delivery arrives, the feed is consumed, you see January 6, 8, and 9. All of a sudden, a few days later, we have index cases of vomiting and diarrhea in those specific populations of pigs that was consuming that feed. So it was very common across all of these cases was the pigs, the, the animals that were consuming the delivered, recently delivered feed were the index cases. We diagnosed the virus, you see, a few days later. 
and then started trying to figure out was this virus in the feed. So what I was when I was trying to wrestling with how to sample a big volume of feed, I didn't really want to take a pound or a, you know just a grab sample. I thought it would be more representative if I went to the bin where the delivery had taken place that the animals again had consumed that feed and now were sick. If I could somehow get a sample of the interior walls of the bin where a lot of the feed residue, the dust had, had hung up. And so I took a paint roller you see there in the little picture on the bottom right and a long pole and I climbed up the bin ladder and I basically put that pole and the paint roller down inside that index bin, so to speak, and started scraping the interior walls. And what do you know, uh, we found PED virus in, in those samples. So you see the CT values, uh, viral RNA and farm A, you know, pretty strong CT values, 20, 22, 19. So there was evidence of RNA in that feed bin. In contrast, if you look at that little picture where you got the two tandem bins there, picture one being the index case bin, picture the other feeding a, a unaffected group of sows, no evidence of virus in that bin. It was just in this specific bin in every case. So I started thinking, well, that's interesting. So we, we have evidence of the virus in the bin that fed the index animals, but was that virus alive? Could it actually infect pigs? Did it, or was it just contamination and the virus was dead? So I took the material that we collected from the sides of the walls, and I was working with Eric Nelson at the time at South Dakota State. We ran a little experiment where we basically fed naive pigs that feed material you see there in the little tray the pigs uh, consuming that feed. And within about three days, we had evidence of vomiting, diarrhea, and we found uh, PED virus in the feces as well as in the intestines after we necropsied the animals. So we, we had proven now uh, for the first time that PED virus or even a virus could be spread through natural feeding behavior. That was That had never been written up before. I went to PubMed to kind of research all this ahead of time plugged in PED and feed, for example, and got zero citations. So it was like breaking a bit of new ground. So I started asking the question, you know, well, how does this feed get contaminated? And by about this time, uh, molecular biologists have determined that the index viruses in the United States from the 2013 epidemic matched very closely, almost 100% homology with uh, PED viruses in China. And even the Chinese scientists were pretty convinced that we probably got the virus from China. So we have uh, a business unit in China. And so I started visiting China. I'd never been to China before. And I went over there and this is what I saw. And I had never seen grain being handled like this. Apparently it's a very cultural thing. It's been done for many years. And it kind of hit home. Well, maybe this is how the virus might contact the feed. If there's a virus in the environment or from animals or truck tires and the feed is, is contaminated this way just naturally by contact with the environment and then bagged up and sent to the U.S., maybe we got the virus that way. And we'll talk about African swine fever, but this becomes really important when we, when we think about this virus, very stable virus. And you can see during epidemics, these pictures from around the world, there's a lot of contamination uh, from dead animals into the environment. And so I'm very worried about the fact that ASF virus could also be potentially moved through the same process of importation. In fact, we have found ASF viral DNA in the commercial feed system in China, in the environment. So we know when there's an epidemic of this virus, uh, this disease, this virus is widespread. So this is not, it started with PED, but it's much bigger than that. And I'll show you some data. Now, let's go into the laboratory and, and show you some experiments that several of us have done together, trying to understand if we could simulate the movement of viruses and feed across the ocean and then across the country from, say, China to the U.S. or Eastern Europe to the U.S. I'll show you how we did that. But you see the publication here and all the people that were involved were really kind of trying to recreate the crime scene and see if viruses can live during simulated journeys across the ocean. And could the, could the feed risk be predicted from the laboratory data? 
So what I did basically, again, working with Eric Nelson, at that time, Diego Diel, who's at Cornell now, but he was at South Dakota State, and Megan Niederwerder from Kansas State, uh, we got together and we started taking feed ingredients that we import from these other countries, uh, basically just cherry picking off the US government harmonized tariff schedule, taking standardized quantities of ingredient, spiking them with a standard amount of virus, and then putting these samples in an environmental chamber that you see there in the bottom right hand corner. And this environmental chamber, we could program uh, the computer to modulate temperature and relative humidity according to um, a journey. If we wanted to move product from place to place, we could kind of simulate the ocean and simulate the uh, land temperature and relative humidity. We set up two models. One was a trans-Pacific model, uh, which was a 30-day, 37-day journey in a transatlantic, a 30-day journey. We sampled during the uh, several times during the uh, experimental periods. We tested for the presence of nucleic acid as well as viable virus. Our main outcome here was, is the virus, are the viruses still alive at the end of these simulated journeys? So here just is the trans-Pacific model. I went to a website called crates.com and I said, well, if I wanna take product from Beijing and I want it to end up in Des Moines, where is it gonna go and how long is it gonna to take to get there? And this program spit out this information. Well, you're gonna start in Beijing, you're gonna go down to the Anquin Terminal in Shanghai, you're gonna cross the Pacific Ocean, enter the United States to San Francisco, and then you're gonna truck on I-80 I I to Des Moines. And so that's a 37 day period of time, including customs and everything. So I set this up that we would sample these fee ingredients multiple times during this 37 day period and kind of see how we set up the sampling points uh, to simulate where the products might be if this was a real journey. We also took, as I mentioned, uh, temperature and relative humidity data historically uh, from a journey of this type and programmed it into the environmental chamber. I kind of just show you our charts that we used of degrees Celsius in the green line and relative humidity in the orange line. It's interesting to me how stable things were over the Pacific, but quite volatile when over land. So we could actually try to recreate the crime scene using representative ingredients, a representative timetable, representative environments. Same thing with the transatlantic model. I was doing this work with Megan Naderwerder in 2016. ASF in China had not yet been reported, but ASF was very active in Eastern Europe. So I created a transatlantic model to basically do the same thing as I just talked about across the Pacific. So we started in Warsaw, Poland, hypothetically. We uh, hit, went down to the coast of France, and the heart of France, across the Atlantic. We entered New York City and then drove then across the interstate to Des Moines. And you can see this is a 30-day timetable, and you can see where we were sampling along the way. Here's the curve, the environmental curve that we used for uh, this journey. It, it was it, This was really hard. This took a lot of time to figure this out. And th a good example is I could not find data on temperature and relative humidity for my model from this transatlantic point of view until I found a PhD thesis from a student in Reykjavik, Iceland, University of Reykjavik, who was studying uh, cod shipments in the North Atlantic and recording north, I'm sorry, recording temperature and relative humidity in the containers as the products are moving across the ocean. So bingo, you know, and you never know until you just got to keep digging. So uh, we put this all together. And again, this is uh, a lot of credit to Eric, Diego, and Megan. Uh, but this is what collectively we came up with. Uh, this is virus survival in ingredients over the 37 or 30 day journey. So we've got the ingredients on the left hand column. And these are ingredients we import into the United States from uh, Asia, from Eastern Europe. You see them listed here. Uh, so we wanted to use representative ingredients that we do bring into the US. Across the top, you see the viruses that we inoculated each of these ingredients with. So SVA, the Seneca virus A, that's a, a surrogate for foot and mouth disease. At that time, we were only working with BSL-2 and BSL-3. ASF, of course, that's African swine fever. PRV is pseudorabies. PED is, you know what that is. Of course, Ancipella virus is a great surrogate for a swine vesicular disease virus. 
CSF is uh, classical swine fever virus. PCV2 is circle virus type 2, PERS virus 174, and then vesicular stomatitis and influenza A of swine. And so we tested these samples at the end of the journey, either through virus isolation or through inoculation of naive pigs via bioassay. And everywhere you see a red box with a plus sign, that means the virus was alive in that ingredient at the end of the journey. So if you just go to ASF, because that's what we're all worried about right now, and go down in that ASF column, you see ASF is very stable in feet. It lives in all the soy products that we tested. Green means it was not alive. So it did not live in the DDGs, the lysine. It lived in choline. It did not live in the vitamin D. It lived all in all the pet foods and the pork sausage casings. And then we had some controls. Uh, complete feed was spiked as a positive control. We had complete feed as a negative control. And we had a stock virus control, which was the little containers we were using in the absence of a feed matrix. So the virus alone in the little plastic container with the vented caps that you saw. So you can see there's several viruses here that are very stable in feed. And if you read horizontally, you see, say, soybean meal conventional at the very top. That's high protein, low fat soy. You see there's a lot of red moving from left to right, meaning that soybean meal, for some reason, is, seems to be quite protective from any of these viruses. So this was the first time that we'd ever entered this room, so to speak. No one had ever really looked at the ability of certain viruses to live in different feed ingredients, especially under these conditions, again, where we tried to recreate the actual event. And Megan Niederwerder and one of her graduate students, uh, Anna Stoyan, followed up on that with some really nice work that they've published uh, looking at whether ASF, African swine fever, could be transmitted by consuming virus-positive feed or water. And it was easily infectious at four logs in feed and one log in the water with a one-time contact point. But as they modeled multiple points of contact throughout the day, say feeding every hour, which pigs do, the infectious dose orally could get much lower and see even down to one log. So as, as we all know, pigs just don't eat one time and then go away. They, they continue to nibble on that feed. And then they used our transatlantic model and basically looked at the half-life of ASF in different feed ingredients. They actually calculated the half-life. And it's pretty fascinating looking at those numbers in days how long this virus lives in feed. You know, we only modeled it out to 30 days, but it appears from these data, it could, be, it could live a lot longer, especially in those interesting soy products that never ceases to amaze me. So great work by Megan and her team. The Plum Island team, Dr. Jonathan Arts, Dr. Carolina Stenfeld, they got interested in this work. And Paul Sundberg from the Swine Health Information Center said, you know, we don't, we need some FMD data. So Chick funded, uh, Jonathan and Carolina to kind of do a lot of the same work with the FMD serotype A and O at Plum Island. And basically, if you kind of just look at the slide, they found the same thing. Uh, both serotypes were transmitted through natural feeding behavior. Both, both serotypes lived out to 37 days in conventional soybean meal, independent of temperature, kind of similar stuff as we've seen before. So again, I think it's another example the risk of feed for a different virus now, the actual FMDV. So I'm really proud that, uh, to have been part of this project too, and really think that Carolina and uh, Jonathan did a great job. So we thank them. Now the critique of this work was, well, that's interesting, but it's laboratory, it's small scale. Uh, does it really work? Does it really happen in the real world? So I'm gonna take you on a little transcontinental journey where we kind of expanded this into the real world. So instead of using five gram quantities of feed ingredients, I'm gonna use one ton totes. You see them there. I'm gonna spike those totes with an ice cube pictured on the right containing PERS virus, Seneca virus, again, surrogate for FMD, and uh, PED. And I'm gonna make a hot spot. I'm gonna take a bag, a tote bag, and I'm gonna dump it into a lower tote bag. And in the middle of that filling process, I'm gonna throw this ice cube into the tote, and then you can see the little hot spot there, because really that's how virus contamination or pathogen contamination in feed appears to work, looking at aflatoxin data, salmonella data. Then we're gonna take these totes, we're gonna take them for a ride on an 18-wheeler, 
We're going to start up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're going to go down to Kansas City. We're going to go up into the mountains, down through uh, Texas, uh, along the Gulf Coast, up the eastern seaboard, and then parallel back to the Midwest along the Great Lakes for 23 days, 10,800 kilometers, and 29 states of coverage, wanting to expose these viruses and these feed ingredients to as many different climates as possible, hot, cold, wet, dry. And then we fed it to pigs. We took those totes, we put them in our research barns, feed bins, uh, and let the pigs eat the feed. And basically, we learned that all three viruses survived the journey. Seneca and PD were a little more hardy. They survived in both complete feed totes and soybean meal totes. PERS virus, not as stable, survived only in the soy. But pigs became infected with all three viruses eventually, which I believe is the first evidence that shows this, that this event can actually happen in the real world, that viruses can survive in representative volumes, representative conditions, and representative routes of long-distance commercial transport. Now, again, that's laboratory. What's happening in the real world? Well, I, I'm accumulating some, quite a few cases now of actual events on farms, and we've published these. And basically, we've found evidence that, of, in this case, it's PED virus, that infected a 10,000 cell breeding herd in Mexico, where virus was found in feed, pigs ate that feed, the farm broke with the disease. So that's a Mexican case. We've seen the same thing in China, where PED virus again has been found in the feed, pigs consume that feed, and the disease became apparent. And just recently, a few months ago, we published this case, which I think is the icing on the cake, where we showed a, uh, the movement of Seneca virus A into a country that was historically negative for this virus in their national herd. And I can tell you now that country was Chile and the feed came from Brazil. So they imported feed uh, soy from Brazil, which we knew had Seneca from previous publications. And so this was a really interesting case where the veterinarians in the Chilean farms actually found the uh, Seneca virus in the imported soy that was sitting in a warehouse getting fed to pigs. And as the feed was getting mixed and fed to pigs, vesicular lesions became apparent, which had never happened before in the country of Chile. And fortunately, it was not FMD. Fortunately, it was only Seneca. But this is the first time I think we've actually got evidence that this, the viruses can actually move between countries in feed. So how do we change human behavior with all this? How do we make things better? Well, one of the things we've been trying to work on a bit is what can we do at the level of the farm or a level at the mill to reduce the risk of viruses in feed? And we've done quite a bit of work looking at different feed additives that may have some antiviral properties. They're not labeled for that. They're not approved for that, but uh, they're on the market for gut health or something else. Maybe some of them have some antiviral properties. So what I did was I went to uh, many companies and I asked them if they wanted to participate, if they had some uh, products they wanted to test in my model, I'll describe, if they had some money they wanted to help uh, with the funding. And you can see the, a lot of people showed up, um, all the companies that are listed in bold, and you can see all the products that we tested. Nice thing about these products, very uh, eclectic group. We got formaldehyde, we got organic acids, monovalent, multivalent medium chain fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, short-term fatty acids, mixtures of all the above, essential oils, prebiotic fiber, a, a lot of different chemistries, which made me happy because I, I wanted options for producers. One size doesn't always fit everybody. I've highlighted two um, products there. You see with the red asterisk, the Guardian product, uh, I helped develop and sold it to Altex, so I have a conflict of interest to disclose. And then the Vigilex product from Provini, it was interesting. They were going to participate in the last minute they pulled out and uh, we just got some producer funds to run that uh, to run that product because each of the companies were supposed to bring their own money and Pravini said they would and then they pulled out. But I just just to be transparent. So basically what we did was we mix up tons of feed either treated with uh, a mitigant or not. So we had treatments and controls and we dropped an ice block down into the bin. Now you see the ice block there. This ice block contains, again, Seneca. It contains PERS and PED. Again, BSL-2 pathogens I can work with. Again, at five logs each. Then we'd let Mother Nature take its course and move 
that ice block and in, 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 and that contaminated feed into our BSL2 facility, and we let pigs consume it. And so you kind of, then we started measuring. So, you know, upper right, we started looking to see whether the viruses had entered the feed. So we were taking Swiffer samples of the feeder. We're taking oral fluid samples there to see whether the pigs contacted the virus and had it in the oral pharynx. And then we looked for clinical scores if pigs got sick. At the end of each of the studies we did, we sacrificed a subset of the animals, took tonsil for Seneca, serum for PERS, and rectal swabs for PD, and then measured their performance. So as I mentioned, we tested a lot of products. We did five different experiments. I just want to show you one experiment for the sake of time, but just kind of look at how we had this set up. We had, in this case, we had five treatments, and we had one positive control. The positive control, remember, being that's feed without a mitigant. So that's just standard feed, no additive, okay? So you can kind of see there were some differences in how some of these products performed, and then some of them were very similar, but pigs on mitigated diets for the most part seemed to have better growth rate as well as lower mortality. And we always had a positive control to compare it to. Here's a nice meta-analysis we did across all of the products, all five experiments, looking at average daily gain versus of, of treatments versus the controls. And you see the forest plot there on the right, and you can see things are favoring the use of mitigants as it, as it pertained to average daily gain. So an interesting observation that kind of independent of product type other than one, it seemed like these mitigants had a positive effect. Maybe they reduced viral load. Uh, they seem to reduce clinical disease. They seem to improve growth and reduce mortality. It's almost like they had an ameliorative effect. I don't know if it was, if they reduced the virus or if they enhanced the immune system or how they actually work. But it was a cool thing because again, there was multiple options now, different chemistries and uh, different solutions for producers and mills. Now, Megan again and the Plum Island group have also studied certain feed mitigants and their effects on African swine fever and foot and mouth disease. And so you see some of the work published here. Uh, looks like formaldehyde and medium chain fatty acid blend neutralized ASF in Megan's experiment. And then uh, foot and mouth disease was neutralized by formaldehyde and organic acids in the Plum Island experiment, but the medium chain fatty acid product was ineffective. So we now have some data, not just on BSL2 pathogens, but on BSL3 and BSL4. So that's the farm, that's the mill. What about the importation? What about the risk of products coming in from another country and bringing something we don't want? We set up a program that we're, uh, it's a voluntary program that's kind of being applied around uh, the US. We call it responsible imports. And it's a way to bring in essential ingredients that maybe we don't make in the US or else they're so cheap if we can buy them from some other place in the US, producers can save a lot of money. But we, we wanted to use science to develop this plan, and I'll explain it to you what we do. But basically, you kind of look at these principles and read down that list. And this is what I mean by changing behavior. You know, we've never, ever thought of talking about feed like this or asking questions about feed movements or feed imports. You know, this is like breeding stock. You know, uh, people have health papers for animals, well, we've got certification for feed now as it leaves the manufacturing plant in another country. And I'll explain how we do that. But it's an interesting change in how we think, you know, what ingredient are we talking about? Uh, is it virus friendly or not? Where is it coming from? Is it in, from a country of high risk? Are there alternative places or ingredients? Um, what are the virus we're worried about mostly? Do we know it's half-life in feed? How long does it take to get the product from the source country to the mill? Is because time is our friend as these viruses sit in this feed. You know, they're going to decay over time. You know, they're not going to replicate. And they're, they're, so we need time as our friend. Have we mitigated in any way? Have we stored under a specific time and temperature again to try to reduce viral activity? I'll show you how we do that. So this is where Sam Nutrition comes into play. Sam Nutrition is a company in Minneapolis, Minnesota that we work with, that our nutrition group works with, because we import products from China. And uh, the products are, you know, either so cheap to buy them from China, or we don't make them in the U.S. 
And so what we've set up with SAM Nutrition is a great program. I'm really happy about this. And this is really the work of Dr. Roger Cochran. Uh, he's our director of feed mills. Also, Dr. Arkin Wu. He's uh, one of our PhD nutritionists, again, from Kansas State. He's from China. And so basically, they set up an auditing system at the manufacturing plant or say, vitamins and trace minerals or whatever product we're bringing in. And they'll, they'll inspect those facilities and, and be sure that they, they pass the inspection. They'll put those ingredients into one-time use tote bags and put them into sealed containers. And they'll then transport them to this warehouse in the upper left-hand corner in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The red arrows show you where the products enter. So those, that's the incoming doors. Uh, so a separate entry point. The yellow arrow shows you two doors, one door for the people who work in the facility and one door for the drivers. And then the green, that's the outgoing product when it's ready to go to the mill. And you see the product sitting in the warehouse below that. It's all wrapped in plastic now. In the middle, the top middle picture, you see what the driver sees when he or she walks in. Uh, this is like a going to a pig farm. You're going to step in a foot bath. You see down below, you're going to sign your name in that little book saying that, yeah, here's, I'm Scott D. I've been here and here and here. Well, my last contact with pigs is this, just like we do when we're entering a sow farm. To me, the most interesting thing about this whole process is the quarantine room, which is what you see in the upper right-hand corner. That's what happens to the feed when it comes in through the red, the door is marked by the red arrow. This is a 30-day period of time. It's an all-in-all-out quarantine room, and it's held at 75 degrees Fahrenheit for that 30 days. And then the door gets closed, as you can see. And if you want to enter that, you have to step again in the foot bath, put on PPE. But it's got its own forklift and everything. It's like truly all in, all out. So again, it's, it's like handling animals. Now we handle feed the same way. So where did the 75 degree Fahrenheit at 30 day data come from? Uh, this is work my son did. That's my son, Nicholas. He's a medical student right now. But this was his uh, Master of Public Health project. He tested different temperatures, either 75 Fahrenheit, 60 Fahrenheit, or 50 Fahrenheit over a 30-day period of time on the ability of Seneca virus and PERS virus to survive or not. So just like that, those little those tote bags and the little ice cube, he went through all that. He stored them in these uh, quarantine rooms at this specific temperature from time and then fed it to pigs. And Nicholas showed very clearly that at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, both viruses died. At 60 degrees Fahrenheit, Seneca lived, PERS died. And at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, both viruses were alive. And so now we've got a protocol that we can use uh, when people ask us, well, how long should I store this? And at what temperature should I store it at? We can give them some scientific data. All right, so another thing about the a recent paper we did, also looking at the role of feed and feed mitigants. Uh, with some nice work that Karen Havis, who is uh, our director of transboundary research at Pipestone, uh, a nice paper. She looked at all our sow farms in our company. We have 75 sow farms in our company that we manage. And Karen wanted to see were there certain biosecurity um, protocols that were beneficial for controlling PERS virus. And one of those was the use of a feed mitigant. That's why I'm bringing it up for our conversation today. And so she took all of our cell farms and studied them for two years, did a lot of very advanced statistics. Karen's brilliant. You know that if you've met her before. And she really found out some interesting things. So basically, when she either looked at air filtration, which is one of her, uh, one, of, one of the interventions we've been using, or feed mitigation, she found that both of those strategies significantly reduced the risk of PERS virus infections, again, in the real world. So I know we're talking, we're not talking air filtration, but filtered farms in this study were 20%, 20 times less likely to become infected with PERS versus non-filtered farms. But in regards to feed mitigation, when a feed mitigant was used, we had PERS in 22% of the farms. But when a feed mitigate was not used, all of those farms broke with PERS. And so the, I wanted to put this in, it's a brand new publication, and I think it drives home the value of considering the use of a feed mitigant for viral diseases. So great work by Karen. So what's this doing around the world? Is anybody paying attention? Is it doing any good? Yeah, a lot of countries now have followed this work and have put together programs. 
in the United States, this is voluntary, uh, but there's a lot of company specific programs in place. You heard about ours. There's many others. We have a, a program being started right now called the U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan. Um, the U.S. SHIP, you may have heard about that, which is a, a strategy to certify farms as ASF and CSF free. And there's several criteria or standards they have to meet. And one of those standards is having a feed biosecurity plan. So feed biosecurity is becoming a standard in the U.S. ship. I was just in Mexico. There's a big project in the northernmost part of the country in the state of Sonora that actually our Pipestone Mexican team is, is working together with Hermosillo, uh, Obregón, and Navajoa producers. So they've got a lot of feed risk biosecurity underway. It's amazing to see how aggressive this group is on using mitigants, feed mill biosecurity. And then nationally, as far as pro national programs, the Canadians, Australians, and the Danes have national programs in place for moving feed ingredients in from countries of high risk. And Europe, the EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, just published a few years ago, maybe now, that the ability of feed to move ASF across the EU is probably a low risk, you know, not like a wild boar, but it can't be ignored due to high consequence. So there's a lot of action around the world going on with this concept. So what this done for us is I think we pay a lot more attention to our imports, you know, and this, these are some data from a friend of mine named Dr. Gil Patterson, who kind of took the U.S. government harmonized tariff schedule. I asked him, you know, soy, for some reason, always has this, you know, seems to be very viral friendly. Are we bringing in soy products from other countries that may have these diseases? And uh, Gil did some analysis. And uh, basically from 2019 to 2022, halfway through 2022, we brought in 15 million metric tons of soy products. 43% uh, of those tonnage came from 23 ASF positive countries. And from these 23 countries, the top four sources year after year were Russia, India, Ukraine, and China, all of which as obviously are very active when it comes to ASF. And so you can see the vast majority is coming from these countries. So we're paying very close attention to this potential risk factor. This is the thing that keeps me up at night. I don't really worry about the uh, vitamins and amino acids. I worry about these bulk ingredients that we've shown laboratory as well as in the field to be protective for viruses that are coming into our country. Now, I wanna give credit to the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. They actually took their uh, guide for industry number 245, uh, which is the, as you can see, risk-based preventative controls for food for animals, rewrote the language a bit and inserted that besides salmonella or toxoplasmosis, biological hazards and animal feed could also include viral pathogens. So I, I, I credit the CVM. Also, Department of Homeland Security is very interested in this topic. I've had several conversations with them. And they've actually featured our Seneca paper in their items of interest a few months ago. We've got some great feedback from ProMed in regards to, uh, especially the Seneca case, where the, the from the Brazil to Chile case. I think what they're saying is, you know, things don't always follow the rule book. There are there are out of the ordinary situations. We have to consider them. We have to test them to see whether they're, you know, there's enough data to be concerned. And so they had some nice things to say about us when we published that. Speaking of publishing, we've put a lot of work into the literature on this topic. Now, remember, this was a discovery back in January of 2014. So the last little observe, you know, the last number I came up with, there's about 72 publications on feed risk for viruses in PubMed. And in Transbounding Emerging Diseases, Dr. Spronk and I co edited, we are guest editors, a special issue on feed risk for disease transmission, the first of its kind. And talking to uh, Wiley Publishing the other day, you can see uh, they told us, well, there's over 30,000 download, 30, downloads. And you can see this, they sent me this nice little heat map of where the, uh, where the uh, edition has been downloaded the most. And so you can see a lot of activity in the United States and in Asia, but uh, six continents have downloaded this information. So again, as I mentioned, we wanted to write this up. We want to put it out there so people have access to it, can read about it, can learn about it. 
Yeah, and speaking of uh, feed, you know, we just we keep writing. We just put this viewpoint out in Javma, and we'll kind of challenging the next generation of swine veterinarians. Says I'm I'm retiring. Gordon Spronk, he's in his retirement mode too. So we're challenging the next generation of swine veterinarians to say, are you ready to lead the industry and deliver science to your customers, the farmers? And one of the topics we we discussed in this viewpoint, which I thought was a really a neat way to write this article, a viewpoint, a fact-based opinion, was that can we keep ASF out of the country? We answered yes. Can we eliminate PERS virus from cell farms? We answered yes. Can we, uh, you know, control these diseases? Can we, can we do the job we need to do and help our farmers? And part of that discussion is we need a feed risk biosecurity program when we put together the next generation biosecurity for a farm, not just cleaning trucks, but also filtering air and also mitigating feed. Gener next generation biosecurity, I think, is the future topic that we'll be talking a lot about in the swine industry. And the end of story, the final uh, comments. Um, I hope I've convinced you that there is abundant scientific information that feed can serve as a vehicle for the transport and transmission of multiple viral pathogens of veterinary significance. And what I'm mostly proud about was the laboratory work we did, I think predicted what's happening in those field cases. Everything we did in the lab basically matched what had happened in China, what's happened in Chile, and what's happened in the other countries that I talked about. So the lab data was, I think, very predictable. Scientifically validated options are now available. We know how to treat this problem at the farm, at the mill, and at the boundaries, at the ports and things. We've got some, we got some real good options to mitigate this risk. But as we all know, we have to work together from a North American perspective. Uh, one country can't do it by themselves. And so I'm just excited to see all the work that's been happening in Canada, really, in, in managing feed risk since 2019. They were the first country to do it. I'm excited what the industry is doing in the U.S. to uh, with U.S. SHIP to control the feed risk. And then again, what Mexico has started to do too. So a lot of, uh, a lot of great effort going around, uh, around the world right now. So with that, uh, Dr. Pettit, Dr. Toring, uh, I, that's the end of my formal presentation. I'll uh, turn off my sh share screen and see if anybody's got any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. D, uh, for a uh, very informative presentation. So we do have a few questions that have been uh, placed into the question and answer feature. Uh, first one uh, is kind of more out of a curiosity. Uh, one of our colleagues has asked, uh, uh, you know, how many total tons of feed did you go through for, for uh, that initial study? This was presented uh, to the Q&A about uh, halfway through your presentation. Oh, yeah. Uh, good question. I don't know. I mean, we, we've been working on this for so long now, uh, nine years, and uh, doing the work at the, at the bin level, the, the field, uh, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I was kind of proud to do a little bit of field epi on that very first case in, in January 2014 when, when we were basically hanging upside down in feed bins trying to scrape the walls of the bins. And I, January is uh, Minnesota, as you know, it's, uh, that, I remember it was minus 30, which is when Fahrenheit and Celsius meet. So, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly, but it's been a lot of tons of feed over the years. And what I'm really proud about this, too, is other scientists, I mentioned several of them, they've replicated this, they've expanded it, and it's just just having all these bra all this brain power to work with. It's been a lot, uh, a lot of fun, but it has been scary stuff, you know, and uh, that's why we, re we replicate it several times. So we know we didn't make any mistakes, but I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly the tonnage, but uh, several, let's just say that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, going back to the first part of your presentation with the uh, uh, PDV outbreaks in the, in the uh, different farms, uh, do you have any idea of the common source or how it got to all three farms? Uh, yeah. yeah, that was, we don't know exactly how 
if there was, I don't think there was a common source because all of these farms had different feed mills. And so, because we don't, in Pipestone, we don't have a central feed mill that we own and operate. We work with about 90 different toll mills around the Midwest. So we don't have control over the mill. And all of these breaks we had had different feed sources. But the one thing they had in common, as I mentioned, was they had a feed outage. And that's when the new feed got delivered. My guess is because I've studied this during the epidemic of PET, and I also did it in China during the epidemic of ASF. Um, once those big populations of naive animals get infected and they start re replicating virus and shedding virus, everything like lights up. So I would go to farms that had PED and the virus was coming out in the dust from the fans. It was on the ground. I would get full of it. My truck would get contaminated. It was like the environment must have been like, like almost like a nuclear bomb when, the, when all that virus takes off up in the air and gets distributed. That's how I believe the, pro, the, the feed gets contaminated. It's not the processing. It's not really the growing. It's the actual post-processing contamination. Uh, another question, and we've gotten this twice now, is do um, you have any thoughts on whether uh, radiation could be used to inhibit or kill virus in feeds um, as opposed to using temperature uh, or how would this compare to using temperature in terms of time and cost? Yeah, good question. I, I'm very confident that the radiation would inactivate these viruses and feed. It's just the logistics of, of doing that on a large scale across all these, these commercial farms. So uh, we can't do it. And I think the cost would be astronomical to do it at the level that we operate at. So that's why we've come up with these holding times or these feed additives as more user-friendly means to reduce the risk, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the irradiation would work. Okay. A um, couple uh, questions with a, you know, and I, I guess this would be a two-part uh, with regard to, you know, types of feed. Um, any thoughts on uh, whether, you know, viruses and specifically this individual and RHDV2 virus could be transmitted in feed hay? Um, or any kind of pellets uh, produced from hay? Yeah, uh, good question. Pelleting will inactivate the majority of these viruses. The challenge is keeping the pellets, it's pellets free of cross-contamination after they're moved from the pellet mill uh, to the farm. Again, environmental risk, I think, is we know how to kill them. It's, now we gotta, we got to keep the products clean. Uh, after, after they're they're manufactured, I haven't done any work with hay, although I do know there's been some work in Europe looking at various crops, and I don't think they really saw a very long lifespan of ASF in crops. Uh, so, I think again, it's it's once the product's done, it, it contacts the virus in the environment, and then that's where the problem begins. Okay. And I guess a, a similar, uh, along the similar vein of, of a specific product, you know, is, is there anything that you feel uh, the properties of soy that make it a good survival environment? Uh, it seemed like soy yeah. was at the top of the list every time. Every time, no matter who did the study, it was always the, the one that was most protective. And factually, the, the Plum Island group, I think it was Dr. Stenfield, Tongue and cheek said, "Well, I don't think we're going to use minimum essential media anymore to store our viruses. I think we're going to start using soy." So, so, but what? Why? I don't know. And I've talked to nutritionists all around the world, and I don't think anybody really knows why that uh, why that happens. Is it the high plant protein? Uh, I know the pH is neutral. That's one thing it's got going in its favor. Many of these ingredients have very alkaline pHs or acidic pHs. It's the meal is a perfect medium for a virus, in my opinion. When I would inoculate these ingredients, the meal seemed to kind of almost make a little protective coating around my inoculum. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's some, I know that was just at the lab level, but I'm wondering if there's just something about how the product is physically made that would protect a virus, but I'm speculating. I apologize. 
Okay. Uh, we'll do just a couple more. Uh, uh, one is, uh, you know, you mentioned that feed ingredients quarantined at higher temperatures were less likely to uh, have viruses of interest. Um, you know, in, would you then extrapolate that, you know, climate of the country of origin uh, could be a component of a risk analysis for imported feed ingredients? I think that's a good idea. You know, even in our models that we do, the transboundary models, we didn't do really a below the equator, or the level of the equator assessment. Um, I guess, and it kind of depends on the virus, though, because if you look at that Seneca case from Brazil to Chile, that was, you know, pretty close to that temperate zone. Um, but I'm, I, I know that, yeah, these viruses don't like temperature, high temperatures. And so if there was a way that they could get exposed to a higher temperature, that would definitely inactivate them. So the environment could have some benefit, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess kind of one, a, 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 you know, you're, you're in an audience or you've got an audience of, uh, you know, veterinary public health professionals uh, looking at One Health. Um, you know, do you anticipate this work could translate to any, you know, human risks, uh, uh, you know, for viral disease transmission for human food ingredients, vitamins, supplements, et cetera? Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, I've, the, on that big red green table at the far right was influenza virus of swine and it lived it didn't live the entire journey but it did live for a part of the journey i remember it, it might have lived for a safe seven to 14 days and we all know that the virus is not that stable outside the host so that's the only pathogen that i've really dealt with that has some uh human uh component to it I've, I would think I'm just, this is kind of a crazy thought, but you know, the coronaviruses, we worked with PED, maybe, you know, you think about COVID, why would SARS-CoV-2 be any different than forced an epidemic diarrhea virus, both coronaviruses? Obviously no data to support, but it'd be a really interesting experiment to see if we could move that virus through our model uh, obviously under much stricter uh, safety conditions, but I've always I've wondered about that several times when I kind of saw how COVID was, how fast it was moving around. And you know, PED when it moved in our farms around the U.S., it moved so fast that it was almost. I've done a lot of experimental infections, and it is almost like I've never seen a pathogen move that quickly before by air, by you know people. You know, so I was just, we were just kind of thinking the one thing that comes to a farm every day, and in those days there was no biosecurity, is feed. And if the mill got contaminated, which the KSU, KSU group has shown very clearly, that if a feed mill gets contaminated with ASF or PED, it's all over the mill and it's very difficult to clean up. So once that mill gets contaminated, I think we're in trouble. And that's one of the things with ASF we have to be very, cognizant about is we're worried about pigs moving it around and trucks moving it around but if we get asf feed's going to move it around very very easily and especially if it gets in the feed mill uh, it's going to be a real challenge so just something to keep on hopefully we don't have to deal with it but uh something to think about as, as we're going through these risk analyses and these kind of like these practice events uh for an asf incursion and, and you know your your presentation focused mainly on the uh, uh, swine diseases, but any any thoughts on ongoing uh, HPAI outbreaks and uh, risk of transmission through feed in the, in the poultry industry? I think that's like hot topic number one. Ought to be somebody ought to do this with HPAI and see if they can reproduce it. You know, we, we have the influence of swine data, so maybe we find out it doesn't, which is good news. But so that, that really should be done. And obviously for our ruminants, we've, with FMD, there's the virus we all worry about a lot in ruminants. So yeah, we've crossed species a little bit there, but uh, yeah. I think other species groups would be interested in this. Yeah. Okay, and I, I'm just gonna go one more question kind of as a, 
a wrap up with, you know, mitigation strategies, any, anything you feel that, uh, uh, you know, the government industry, and this might be a bigger question that we want to try to tackle today, but, you know, you know, is there something that could be done at a higher level to, to help mitigate some of the um, issues you presented, or is this more of a, uh, at the farm or, or feed production level? To mitigate yeah good that's that's really the rubber meets the road and i really compliment the government agencies for all the great work they're doing with keeping asf out but the thing that keeps me up at night is are these soy imports and i know there's trade and i don't want to start a trade war and all that but uh they're, it's coming in basically under the guise of organic and uh I'm not sure it really is. I mean, a lot of it's coming from countries where maybe organic is not properly certified. But to me, that's the thing that worries me because the, the micro ingredients we can manage real easy. You know, they're in 50 pound bags or one ton totes, we can store them. But you start worrying about a bolster carrying soy, all those tons. And it's so much harder to manage that across all the different ports we've got in the United States. You know, the Canadian. They only have six ports, I think, so it's easier for them to manage their imports. But to me, if there's one thing we could do, it somehow stop that from happening or mitigate it somehow. I'm not saying block it, but I'm saying somehow could we manage it to reduce that risk? Could we put an intervention in place? Uh, one idea that comes to my mind is why don't we just make our own organic soy in this wonderful soybean industry that we have in the United States? But I know there's a lot more to it. I'm not a specialist in trade, but I think that's the biggest stumbling block. But that's the one to your question. That's the burning question that has not been answered yet. All right. Well, we we have reached our hour plus, and and I think uh, that's an indication of the the quality of the presentation and the the interest in the in the topic. You know, definitely we we appreciate it. I'm going to turn it back over to. Uh, Dr. Pettit for uh, her final comments, and uh, Dr. Pettit. Well, thank you very much for the awesome presentation. I think we can all definitely say it was both scary and enlightening. Uh, for the rest of the group, if you guys have any suggestions on speakers or topics that you guys would like to hear from for future CE webinars, please let us know uh, through the website or directly to the members of the CE committee. Uh, we're always looking for future speakers. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I would I would just like to uh, chime in. Um, you know, if, if you send me an email, again, I'll say it a third time, admin at acvpm.org uh, with any of your nominated speakers, or if you'd like to uh, uh, speak yourself, um, I can get that to the CE committee. We can't do this without, uh, without volunteers like... Uh, like Dr. D. So I want to thank Dr. D. Uh, fantastic presentation. And uh, uh, definitely, I want to wish everybody a great afternoon, evening, wherever you may be in the world. So with that, I will close the session. Thank you very much.